Hello, I'm Dr. Susan Connolly, consultant cardiologist and clinical lead for the Our Hearts, Our Minds program. Today I want to talk to you about medication for your heart. I see patients in clinic all the time after they've developed a heart condition and their, their questions and thoughts about medication are always the same. Do I have to take these forever? They find medication burdensome and intrusive. They feel it causes side effects and symptoms. They worry about the doses that we keep changing. And they feel it can impact their quality of life. And that's all true, taking medication is burdensome. But I think we should look at it the other way and look at the positive sides of taking medication. I talk about control a lot in my talks, but that's exactly what medication does in heart conditions. It gives you back control of your heart condition and hopefully then prevent you ever having another problem again. But to do that, you need to take the right medications at the right doses and take them every day. It's very human to miss a dose of medication, but when you start missing doses regularly, then the beneficial effect will be lost. Try and remember when it's easiest to take them, if it's in the morning after your cup of tea or at night before you go to bed. As long as you take them every day, uh, that is the main thing. I want to talk to you about the medications that are crucial. I don't like taking tablets, so I won't ask my patients to take tablets they don't need. But there are certain medications, after a heart attack in particular, that reduce the risk of dying and another heart attack. So these, in my opinion, are non-negotiable because you don't want another heart attack and we don't want you to have one. The main classes of these drugs are antiplatelets, for example, aspirin or ticagrelor, drugs called ACE inhibitors or sartans, beta blockers and statins. And let's talk about these in a bit more detail. Let's start with antiplatelet therapy. So aspirin after a heart attack is for life. We also ask you to take most commonly ticagrelor and usually for one year. These drugs stop your platelets sticking together. Platelets sticking together is key in clot formation and you remember I showed you in the talk on heart disease what happens when a plaque cracks and the clot forms on top. So taking aspirin for the rest of your life reduces your risk of another clot. We also ask you to take a second blood thinner, usually in the first year after your heart attack, because that's when the risk of another heart attack is highest. And generally at one year, we ask you to stop the ticagrelor. What are the downsides of these medication? Well, the obvious one is bleeding, but overall the bleeding risk is small and it's greatly outweighed by the benefit of taking the tablets. If you're at high bleeding risk, for example, if you have a history of a recent bleeding stomach ulcer, then we may shorten the length of medication taking. For example, the ticagrelor we may only give you for six months, but that's something you need to talk to your cardiologist about directly. The second class of drugs that are crucial are called ACE inhibitors. If you can't tolerate an ACE inhibitor, we prescribe something similar called an angiotensin receptor blocker, and they often end in the, in the term sartan. ACE inhibitors work by preventing an enzyme in your body from producing angiotensin II, which constricts your blood vessels. Therefore, ACE inhibitors lower blood pressure. Yes, they do have side effects, but generally they're well tolerated. Side effects include kidney impairment, so we have to monitor your blood tests to look at your kidney function. They can cause a bit of dizziness, particularly with the first dose. Up to 1 in 10 patients will get a dry cough, particularly at night, and if that happens, we'll switch you to an alternative. Allergic reaction can happen, but is very uncommon. The key message with ACE inhibitors is after a heart attack, 
we use them not to treat your high blood pressure, but to reduce your risk of another heart attack. And the trials have shown that happens irrespective of your blood pressure. So I have many patients saying to me in clinic, but my blood pressure is low. Why do I need to take more of this drug? And the answer is because even if your blood pressure is on the low side, this drug will reduce your risk of another heart attack. And the more you're on of it, the better. The higher the dose, the more effective it is. And the dose we aim for, in example for Ramipril, is 10 milligrams. If you have a damaged muscle pump from your heart attack, or if you have heart failure or diabetes, it's even more crucial we get you on this medication at a good dose. Some patients can't tolerate a higher dose, and that's okay, as long as we find the highest dose that you can tolerate, and then you take it every day. The third class of drugs are beta blockers. A common example of a beta blocker is bisoprolol. Beta blockers work by reducing the heart rate. So they reduce the work the heart has to do and therefore the amount of oxygen it needs. They do lower blood pressure. They do have side effects. They can make you feel tired. They can give you cold extremities and they can cause some dizziness. They're a good treatment for angina. But the key message for beta blockers after a heart attack is we use them to reduce your risk of another heart attack or of dying. It's really important we get you on the highest dose we can and we're aiming for a heart rate of around 60 beats per minute. Again, if you have a damaged pump from your heart attack, beta blockers are particularly important to take. And lastly, statins. When I talk to patients about statins in clinic, they can often look horrified because they've read on the internet or heard from their friends about these terrible side effects. So let's talk about this a bit more. And this is probably the most important part of the talk because statins now have been around for 25 years since I started training in cardiology. And in my opinion, they've absolutely transformed the management of patients with heart disease and made it a very manageable disease. Statins are used to lower cholesterol. Cholesterol is one of the fats in your blood. Bad cholesterol or LDL cholesterol builds up in plaques as we discussed earlier. The average LDL cholesterol in the UK is three millimoles per liter. Now that mightn't sound very high, but we know from studies that plaque in the heart grows after a heart attack unless we get the bad cholesterol down and the target is less than 1.4. So that's quite a long way to go from three to 1.4. And if this is your second heart attack, we aim for an even lower LDL cholesterol of less than one. So patients say to me, well, why can't I do it with lifestyle? And absolutely, there are lifestyle changes you can make to lower your cholesterol. Reducing your saturated fat consumption, eating fiber, oats. Regular physical activity doesn't lower your LDL cholesterol a huge amount, but it puts up your good cholesterol. But there's a limit to what lifestyle can do to your serum cholesterol level. And even at best, it will lower it by about 15%. Now remember back to the slide before. If your LDL cholesterol starts out at three and we want to get it to 1.4, we need a fairly significant reduction. And that can only be achieved with medication. So it's not a battle between statins and lifestyle. It's using the two together. But using statins at the right dose, high intensity statin is what the terminology we use, we can lower cholesterol by 55%, and that's the game changer. Why do we aim for such a low cholesterol? Because we want to stabilize plaque. This plaque, as I've said before, can occur in many, many parts of the artery wall and it can be lying there very silent. What we want to do is stop it in its tracks. 
and actually high intensity statin therapy has enabled us to do that. And if we get the cholesterol low enough, we can even push the plaque back and shrink it. That's really powerful and a really good reason to take statins. We talk about high intensity statin therapy. So the dose you should be on is important. And the only two statins you should be taking ideally are atorvastatin at a dose of 40 or 80 or rosuvastatin at a dose of 20 to 40. The trials have clearly shown that these higher doses lead to reduced risk of further heart attack. And th that's led to cardiologists using the motto, lower is better. There's a lot of negative news stories about statins and on the internet, and that causes patients concern. And that can lead them to perceived side effects, and it can lead them to stop their statin. Uh, advice from friends or relatives about statins can also lead to patients stopping their statins. If you're having problems with your statin, please talk to your doctor who's an expert on this and can give you the correct information. Let's try and separate the myths around statins and let's try and distill out the truth. Statins don't cause cancer, that is definitive. They don't cause memory loss. Although that was reported originally, uh, that was just by patient report and it hasn't been borne out in studies. Indeed, statins have even been shown to protect cognition or how the health of the mind, probably because they improve vascular health. They don't cause insomnia. In fact, they can promote sleep quality. The biggest bugbear with statins that patients complain of is muscle pain. Now in trials, when patients are given a dummy drug, muscle pain is no more common in the patients treated with statins. But we do see it in clinical practice. Often this is a perceived side effect and people can have muscular aches and pains for other reasons and it's not necessarily the statin. There's also reports that they can cause cataracts. That's not correct and not proven. Some reports that they can cause erectile dysfunction, but actually statins can help erectile function because they promote arterial health. Yes, there is a small increased risk of diabetes with statins, that is true. But it's been shown to cause diabetes in patients who are going to get diabetes eventually. It just brings it on a bit earlier. Nonetheless, the benefit of the statin far outweighs the risk, the small increased risk with the diabetes. So that shouldn't be a reason not to take statins. Azetamibe. We are starting to use this drug more and more. So you may notice you were discharged from hospital on a torvastatin or resuvastatin, and now we're asking you to take an additional tablet. Why? Azetamibe is a great drug. It lowers cholesterol, not as much as statins, only by about 15 to 20%. But it works really well when you add it on to a statin. And if you remember, some patients we want to get their cholesterol very low. And azetamibe is a useful tool in helping us get to very low levels. We don't give it to everybody, but if you're younger, or if you've extensive heart narrowings, or if you've diabetes, sometimes we want to be more aggressive and get your cholesterol even lower, and we will ask you to consider taking azetamibe. It's not our decision. We'll always talk to you about it, and hopefully we can make the decision together. This has been a very brief tour through uh, cardiac medications. I wanted to give you the key points that I feel are important from my perspective in talking to patients over the last 20 years. There's a, a lot more detail you may want to know and included with your information packs that we send out to you is this excellent booklet from the British Heart Foundation which goes through the medications in more detail and you should refer to this resource also. Thank you very much for listening.